This looks like a quorum to me, so let's go ahead and get started, okay? Um, for anybody I've not met, which isn't very many of you, my name is Ron Washburn, and I'm one of the infectious disease doctors here. I spend most of my time at the VA hospital. And I have to give you just a tiny bit of background before I start talking about these fungal infections, because you may ask, why is this guy talking about these uncommon fungal infections? Well, it started when I was a fellow. I did a little uh, different kind of ID fellowship than a lot of people do in that I had one year of general ID training with a lot of consult rotations at several hospitals in Maryland. And then for the subsequent three years, um, I focused almost exclusively on the study of fungal infections in a clinical mycology lab at the NIH. And I've really liked fungal infections ever since then. So um, I'm happy to bring this to you. Um, why not talk about some of the more common ones? Well, I feel that in general, um, people's knowledge bases for the common ones, like the opportunists, uh, Candida, Aspergillus, and Mucor are pretty good. Um, and I would say the same thing about the endemic mycoses, Histo, Blasto, and Coxi. Um, we see a fair amount of all those types of infections. But the bugs I'm going to talk about today are less common, at least in our environment here in Louisiana. And I think that they're still important to talk about for a couple of different reasons. One is, as you'll see, some of them can masquerade as non-infectious illnesses. So some can be confused, for example, with skin cancer or cutaneous sarcoidosis. When we see granulomas on skin biopsies, um, we really need to do special stains because when we do, we may stumble into some of these oddball fungi as well as some potentially oddball uh, mycobacterial infections. Um, and another point is that even with, within the world of fungal infections, the bugs that I'm going to talk about now are masqueraders. And by that, I mean that not every organism that looks like Aspergillus in tissue is Aspergillus. We won't know that until we have a culture and some additional information. By the same token, not every organism that looks like Candida albicans in tissue is Candida albicans in tissue. And this will be clear as we go through this talk. It's not even true that a patient with a positive serum cryptococcal antigen necessarily has to have cryptococcosis. There's another fungus that commonly gives um, cross-reactive positive cryptoantigens in the serum. And as you may be aware, um, not every organism that causes a positive serum galactomannan assay is Aspergillus. There are some other organisms that also yield a positive galactomannan test in serum. And so let's take a look at these issues. We'll start off with one of our uh, VA patients to make a couple of points. We're focusing on a 49-year-old man with insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus, <coughs> dyslipidemia, hypertension, chronic kidney disease, a history of B-cell lymphoma, now in remission after chemotherapy, and a history of deep vein thrombosis. Way back in 1991, when he was on active duty in the Army, he noticed a blister on the dorsum of his right foot while stationed in Kentucky, which evolved into a firm lesion. And we're still having problems with this syndrome today in this man. He's recently had a transmetatarsal amputation. The point here is that not all fungi are clinically susceptible to our antifungal agents. Three years after the onset, um, the lesion was biopsied in 1997, 
yielding on H and E stain acute and chronic inflammation and granulomas and um, pigmented spheres, which were described as copper pennies by the pathologist. And it turns out that those are buzzwords that pathologists use to describe the organisms that cause chromoblastomycosis. So that's the first syndrome we're going to be talking about this morning. Culture yielded a fungus called Phyllophora, which is one of the brown pigmented fungi and is on the list of organisms causing um, this infection. Um, at that time, uh, the clinicians caring for the patient were aware of the poor responsiveness to antifungal agents, even to amphotericin B. And one of the accepted initial approaches is excision and skin grafting. So this is what was done. And it was quite successful um, until the patient presented seven years later seeking medical attention for a gradual recurrence. At that time, plain x-rays showed no bone involvement. And that's an important point. Chromoblastomycosis typically does not cause bone involvement, and that's going to be a contrast that we're going to draw with the second syndrome that I'm going to talk about, which otherwise shares some features in common with this syndrome. Um, in general, the patient at that time had a fairly high threshold for um, concern, and so he walked around with this lesion on his foot for another seven years before he uh, presented to the VA requesting attention for this. And so it was biopsied and cultured. And this is what was seen. So um, here we have the um, deep tissue uh, beneath the crusted lesion that was on his foot um, with a uh, fairly generous inflammatory response. And these brown pigmented spheres these are called by the pathologists copper pennies. Um, this is not a fungal stain. This is just melanin being produced by the organism in tissue seen on H and E stain. And when the organism grows in culture on synthetic medium, it grows as a brown colony. Silver stain made it perhaps easier to pick out the fungal forms in tissue. And this is a textbook picture of the same organism, again, uh, probably dem demonstrating even better the copper penny appearance in a cluster. Um, this interesting point is just that the organism can have a couple of different uh, morphologies in tissue. One can be as the separated copper pennies. But the same organism can produce these things called muriform pigmented cells, which looks kind of like um, one big sphere with some walls within it, hence the name muriform for walls. This time, a different cause of chromoblastomycosis was cultured from the lesion called Fonzacea, which is somewhat more common as a cause of chromoblastomycosis than Phyllophora. One doesn't know whether both bugs may have been there the whole time and different bugs were recovered during different decades due to sampling error um, versus um, what was going on, but um, didn't consider this to be especially surprising. The patient initially declined antifungal therapy, but then accepted itraconazole in early 2012. Never had a clinical response or a detectable itraconazole blood level. Um, I wasn't totally convinced at that time that he was necessarily compliant with the treatment, although uh, stomach acid could have been an issue. As you know, itraconazole is um, normally absorbed only in the presence of acid stomach pH. And this is why we tell patients to take the drug with Coke. Um, therefore, uh, later in 2012, he was switched to one of the other recommended therapies for chromoblastomycosis, which was terbinafine, 500 milligrams a day. 
Um, and if you're interested in the references, those that I've listed at the bottom um, talk about some of the information leading to those uh, guideline therapies. He still had an inadequate response. At that time, I did some more reading and doubled the dose of terbinafine to 1,000 milligrams a day and conferred with a um, physician at the Army Medical Center in San Antonio who um, has written the chapter in Principles and Practice of Infectious Diseases on these bugs and asked him if I was doing anything wrong and his response was, nope. Um, oftentimes this infection doesn't respond to antifungals. And so that's actually what happened. We ended up replacing the terbinafine with posiconazole. The patient couldn't tolerate it because of GI side effects, and we resumed the terbinafine, just hoping that we were slowing down progression of this infection. By that time, this is what the dorsum of his foot looked like. You see this raised. Um, bumpy lesion, which looks deeply invasive. His toes are on the right-hand side of the slide over here. And the bottom line is that he eventually developed so much chronic pain from this lesion that he was willing to undergo transmetatarsal uh, amputation to get rid of the lesion, and that's now been successfully done, and he's still being followed at the VA. Um, here I've added a couple of textbook pictures of chromoblastomycosis which have not yet been treated and so they have the treatment naive more natural appearance of the lesion which is described as large cauliflower like raised lesions usually found on the extremities and as we'll see a couple of slides down the road um, Probably the reason that we see them on the extremities is that the organism is typically introduced percutaneously through thorn um, or other vegetation injuries. Here's another textbook appearance of chromoblastomycosis, which once again shows these wart-like or cauliflower-like raised lesions, which are perfectly classic. And once again, despite how nasty those lesions look, um, bone involvement beneath the lesions is not expected in this syndrome. Um, so let's just summarize a few points about chromoblastomycosis. Why did our patient get this? He initially noticed the lesion when he was on active duty in Kentucky, but he had been stationed um, in Kuwait and other areas of the Middle East during the years uh, prior to presentation, and we assumed that he likely got inoculated when he was in that environment. As I mentioned, the source is uh, vegetation associated with minor trauma. Um, there's a four to one male to female predominance. Perhaps some of this is due to um, increased exposure in males. And the next bullet point just talks about the progression from uh, more superficial scaly lesions to deeper nodules and raised plaques. One other point that's important to mention is that sometimes these lesions have black dots at the surface. And um, this is ascribed to the fact, as I mentioned, that the fungus itself is pigmented. Um, and um, Clumps of the fungus can be extruded uh, through the transepithelial layers of the lesion, so it gives these little black punk tape uh, lesions at the surface sometimes. And finally, once again, this infection typically does not involve bone. Um, this slide talks about uh, a differential diagnosis for nasty looking lesions like that, which could include <coughs> cutaneous sarcoidosis, um, skin cancer, or some other infections like um, t uh, leprosy or sporotrichosis. Um, once again, the bugs themselves are pigmented. We've already said this, um, the, but the next point is that the typical inflammatory response is pyogranulomatous, very similar to blasto, and also associated with fibrosis. 
the final point talks about some of the recommended therapies, which, as I mentioned early, don't necessarily always have to involve potentially toxic systemic antifungal drugs, because oftentimes this infection doesn't respond very well to them. But if we're going to try them, the better ones are itraconazole and terbinafine, not ampho. Um, this slide, I think, shows that we're getting ready to transition into the next fungal infection syndrome that I want to discuss, but it makes an extreme point about the fact that chromoblastomycosis can disseminate, especially in little kids, um, and even could be uh, potentially fatal in that setting from extensive involvement of skin surfaces. Um, this particular kid, was from El Salvador, um, and the causative organism in this case was a, a different one of the brown pigmented fungi called Exophyla. Here you see the dark colony growing on synthetic media. Now we're going to stay in the subtropics for a while um, with males getting exposed uh, skin lesions in the jungle. Um, but we're going to talk about mycetoma instead. Um, a somewhat related syndrome to chromoblastomycosis, um, overlapping uh, list of organisms that can be responsible for the infection, but a different clinical presentation. I'll try and highlight some of those points. Um, once again, the source is thought to be minor trauma through the skin from uh, vegetation matter. Um, once again, we have a male to female predominance. And I've put asterisks on the clinical features of mycetoma that set it apart from chromoblastomycosis. In this case, we have chronic draining sinus tracts that are spitting out grains or granules, little particles, little particles of sand. Um, and although we have granulomatous inflammation, we don't have big cauliflower-like lesions protruding from the skin. We have more like just some raised nodules with draining sinuses with these little particles of sand being extruded. And um, this may involve underlying bone with an associated osteomyelitis, whereas chromoblastomycosis doesn't tend to do that. And we have, broadly speaking, two different uh, types of uh, cutaneous mycetomas, dark-grained versus light-grained. The dark-grained ones are called eumycetoma and are caused by pigmented fungi um, including Majorella, which is common worldwide, and a long list of other brown pigmented fungi, which overlaps with the list that caused chromoblastomycosis. But here the inflammatory response is a little different, and we've got draining sinus tracts. The light-grained ones can be caused either by Pseudalasheria, which is one of the weird fungi that I'm going to be talking about in a few minutes, um, which is an aspergillus look-alike in tissue and is not pigmented in tissue. Um, it looks just like aspergillus in tissue. The name of um, that appearance um, is a little esoteric, but just FYI, that's called hyalohyphomycosis when we have invasive hyphae in tissue that look like aspergillus, which aren't pigmented. So in the U.S., Actually, Pseudalasheria is the most common cause of mycetoma, and um, in that case, there would be um, lightly colored uh, sand granules being extruded through sinus tracts. Um, however, it's also possible to see light-grained uh, mycetoma caused by filamentous bacteria like nocardia. Um, and in that case, um, these are called actinomycetomas. And that's the most common etiology in India of mycetomas, where I understand mycetomas are fairly common. So um, this 
photo from a book chapter who, uh, by Leah Yellow, who was a very famous um, mycologist who worked at the CDC almost his entire career, shows an arm affected by eumycetoma. Here we don't see raised cauliflower-like lesions. We see what look like chronic lesions with little um, holes in the center which represent the openings of the sinus tracts and it's from these that we would occasionally see um, sand granules being extruded and that would be diagnostic material that we could culture and get the etiologic agent. This particular one's caused by Majorella and just, um, you know, uh, something I want to share with you is that I understand that people who work in endemic areas, uh, um, physicians are very familiar with this syndrome and they know that if you cover those sinus tracts with gauze um, and just have the patient cha change the gauze once or twice a day, um, that sometimes a, a sand granule will wind up on that gauze and you can instruct the patient to bring that to you so you can take it to the lab for culture. This slide shows a uh, granule from mycetoma caused by Nocardia brasiliensis. So this is actinomycetoma, not eumycetoma. Um, and basically within this granule, um, there are wall-to-wall -wall, uh, Nocardia um, that are all clustered together and are viable culture material. So what's the therapy? Um, Part of it can be comprised of surgery with excision of sinus tracts and also uh, focused antimicrobial therapy can be targeted against the causative organisms. So in cases where the organisms are the brown pigmented fungi, the treatments of choice are itraconazole or terbinafine again, very similar to chromoblastomycosis. But obviously for nocardia, then uh, Bactrim would be the drug of choice and some of the therapy issues are reviewed in those references. So that's all I was gonna say against mycetoma. And next we're gonna switch syndromes once more um, and show our little risk taker um, going through an episode of near drowning um, he's almost totally submerged in the water, but he's rescued and doesn't look so hot. Um, he hadn't actually drowned, but a few weeks later he did actually die. And so what are we talking about? Well, it, it may be an aspirated uh, freshwater bug of some kind, right? So it could be plesiomonas. Um, or if it were brackish water, it could be Naglaria, um, which has happened in this state occasionally. Or what am I thinking? And um, this is ID board question-like material. I'm not sure about internal medicine, but it's the association between life-threatening Pseudalasheria infections and near drowning. Um, so the source of the organism is uh, soil and water. Um, and at the top of the list, I've put that potential board question, which is near drowning followed by invasive pneumonia with or without brain abscess. So it's a lung brain syndrome. And of course, there are a bunch of those in the world of ID. Another one would be aspergillus. Another one would be nocardia. But in this case, pseudalasheria is causing a lung brain syndrome in a near drowning victim. And when the pneumonia or the brain abscess is biopsied, what do we see? We see angioinvasive hyphae that look exactly like aspergillus and tissue. And that's the report we're gonna get back from the pathologist. Um, but it's just because pseudalasheria is morphologically masquerading as aspergillus in tissue. There are some other organisms that look just like aspergillus and tissue, and we're gonna talk about one or two more of those. Um, 
And perhaps locally, this is more relevant to us because we have a huge immunocompromised population that we follow, both in our inpatient and outpatient settings at LSU. Um, and it's not uncommon for us to get um, pathology reports that say we've got something that looks like invasive aspergillosis in tissue, but then the ID people will usually want to know something more about that organism, like um, was it uh, sent for culture as well? So life-threatening, life-threatening. Then there are some non-life-threatening infections that pseudalisuria can cause. One of them is mycetoma. We already talked about that one. Um, and, but it also can cause invasive or non-invasive sinusitis. Why? Well, the organisms are more or less ubiquitous. They're in the soil, they're in the water, and when something disturbs the soil, the spores become airborne, so we inhale them. And so they get filtered through the sinuses and on the way down to the lungs. They actually, in a previously partially obstructed sinus, can germinate in the uh, sinus air spaces. And in a normal host, typically this process is non-invasive. So what do we see in here? We're seeing an individual with chronic right-sided congestion and maxillary sinus pain and tenderness who's got chronic sinusitis basically, but the CT scan shows that the bony walls of the maxillary sinus are totally intact. It doesn't look like it's invading. And this uh, frame over here demonstrates that it's really not. It was biopsied and surgically extirpated um, just simply by scooping out all of the um, non-invasive hyphal material here. And on the left-hand side, we see the person's tissue. And on the right-hand side, separated by a little bit of airspace, we see a, a mass of non-invasive hyphae that weren't invading the tissue. They were just sitting out there in the airspace because the host defenses, like the mucosa and the neutrophils, were keeping the organism from invading. Um, on the left-hand side, I'm just showing something that's kind of a cute little morphological thing, a uh, tool that's used by clinical mycologists to show you that um, in the oxygen tension that's present in the sinuses and cavities in the lung, the organism can sporulate in situ in, uh, in the human host. And when it does, it can form this sporulating structure, which is called a caremium. Um, people say it looks kind of like fingers on a hand. Um, this is actually spores from pseudalisuria in the sinus airspace. Um, things for spores in that the fingers yeah, this, this, the fingers are, as I understand it, these are actually the spores. Um, I'm not too sure what the round things would be. They may be um, hyphae that are uh, cut, uh, cross-cut, seen on their ends. Um, I'm not too sure about that part. Um, but the, the, the real point here is that this here is a pathognomonic structure. If a clinical mycologist sees this, they're going to say, that's pseudalisuria. They almost don't need a culture. Um, on the right-hand side, I'm just re-emphasizing the fact that pseudalisuria, particularly in the U.S., may be a cause of um, light granuled cases of mycetoma. So this is pseudalisuria granule um, seen in cross-section on an H&E stain. What's the therapy for pseudalisuria? Um, well, the bottom line is that it is resistant to amphotericin B. It's clinically resistant. And so this is one of the reasons that we should care um, when we get a pathology report back that says this looks like aspergillus in tissue as to whether it is aspergillus in tissue. Because if we had a critically ill neutropenic patient 
in the unit, um, and we really believed that it was aspergillus in tissue, a lot of us would still feel perhaps more comfortable with amphotericin than azoles for a critically ill patient. Um, others would feel comfortable with voriconazole, but in this case, without a culture, if it turned out that it was really pseudalacheria in tissue, we wouldn't be treating it by giving amphotericin. Um, however, the organism is susceptible to azoles, and based on some small studies, it's actually, uh, for aconazole is actually approved as the drug of choice now for pseudalacheria. Fusarium is another aspergillus lookalike in tissue, um, but it has some clinical features which really set it somewhat apart from aspergillus, and I'm gonna try and touch on some of those. Um, it's another ubiquitous organism that's found um, uh, in soil, water, and on plants. And um, normal hosts may uh, develop infectious syndromes caused by this organism. It's on the list of non-pigmented fungi that can cause mycetomas. But what's more important, and I think this is common enough maybe even to be fodder for internal medicine tests, although I don't know that for a fact. Um, fusarium is the most common fungal cause of post-traumatic uh, keratitis, and it's very aggressive. I think the number one overall cause would probably be some of the gram negatives um, to cause post-traumatic keratitis, for example, associated with uh, contact lens use. Um, so these are localized infections. However, the organism also can cause uh, life-threatening pneumonia or disseminated infection in neutropenic patients or severe burns. And it looks just like aspergillus in tissue. But one thing it does that sets it apart from um, invasive aspergillosis is to cause uh, destructive skin lesions. And so fusarium in the setting of a uh, prolonged neutropenia when it's presenting with um, some pulmonary infiltrates and fever may also present with this odd looking skin rash and the diagnostic material is in there. If we biopsy these, we'll see the organisms that look like angioinvasive aspergillus. And aspergillus, I'm gonna make kind of a blanket statement that's a slight exaggeration. It just doesn't do this. This would be very atypical behavior for aspergillus. That's kind of board material stuff, I believe. Um, and another thing that sets fusarium apart from invasive aspergillosis is that it actually very commonly causes positive blood cultures. Um, what the explanation is for this behavior, I'm not really sure, because both aspergillus and fusarium are hyphal organisms that are angioinvasive, but um, it's, um, really exceedingly uncommon to have a true positive aspergillus blood culture. You should always think that that's a potential contaminant. Whereas a positive blood culture for fusarium in the appropriate clinical setting is telling you the cause of this life-threatening syndrome. Um, when this organism sporulates, which it typically would do only on synthetic medium in the lab. It has funny looking spores, very funny looking, um, characteristic sickle shaped, um, huge um, septated spores that are typical of fusarium. Um, what are some of the clinical things to say? Why does any of this matter? Um, fusarium is an even worse bug than aspergillus is in an immunocompromised host. Um, the overall mortality exceeds that for aspergillus. Um, it's more refractory to therapy. That comes as, I guess, kind of a corollary. 
Um, the first line therapy is amphotericin, but voriconazole is FDA approved based on a 43% response rate in a small series, so it's a bad bug. Next, we'll spend a few minutes on Penicillium marnefii. This organism we probably won't see in Louisiana much, but it's a problem for AIDS patients in Southeast Asia. There, it's present in the soil. It's actually a thermally dimorphic fungus, meaning it grows as a fuzzy mold at 30 degrees in the lab, but as a shiny yeast at 37 degrees. And so what this is going to mean is that in human tissue, it's going to look more like yeast, and that's what it does. Um, the major risk factor is AIDS patients, and what it does in them is chronic pneumonia, sometimes progressing to disseminated infection and fungemia. Um, this organism causes a positive Aspergillus galactomanan test in serum in the majority of cases. And there are a couple of other bugs that cause uh, positive galactomanan tests in addition to Aspergillus. This is a silver stain showing Penicillium marnefii in a splenic abscess and makes the point that the extracellular forms are typically a little larger and septate, whereas the intracellular forms are smaller. They look like budding yeast, and they really look like H. capsulatum in tissue. And so it's interesting because um, clinically and um, morphologically in tissue, this organism looks like H. capsulatum. Um, it, it really behaves a lot like it. Um, can cause pneumonia followed by disseminated infection and causes little tiny intracellular um, yeast within macrophages, but it's a different organism. Uh, treatment is amphotericin B induction therapy followed by switch to itraconazole um, with long-term suppression until the immune system recovers. Let's come back to the U.S. to finish up here. Um, next, I'm going to talk about a weird bug called trichosporin. And this, the import, one importance of this organism is that um, its clinical behavior in the compromised host and its morphologic appearance look, looks a lot like candida. But it's not candida. What is it? It's an organism, the most common thing that it does to people worldwide is to cause a superficial mycosis of the scalp called white piedra. But our concern here in this audience is more about the fact that this organism is on a long list of fungi that can cause life-threatening infection in severely immunocompromised hosts, including neutropenic hosts. The tissue form is yeasts and septate hyphae. It looks kind of like candida in tissue. Um, yeasts and septate hyphae. It doesn't look exactly like C. albicans, but it's pretty close. And this is the bug that I alluded to at the beginning. It actually routinely causes a false positive uh, serum cryptococcal antigen. Um, and so that's almost like a diagnostic test for trichosporin in that clinical setting, which is a little different from a, a classic setting for cryptococcosis, which would have been um, not a neutropenic host, but an AIDS patient or a Hodgkin's lymphoma or a sarcoid. Um, if we are lucky enough to see the organism in tissue, then we're going to know right away that it's not crypto, of course. It really doesn't look like crypto in tissue. Um, this is another organism that responds poorly to amphotericin, but um, does respond somewhat to azoles, and there's a reference. Um, 
This is the prompt to say uh, in the ID crowd, this is the pimp question for the fellows is, what are we demonstrating here? What fungus are we going to talk about next? This is a bag of TPN containing intralipid. There's an organism that we have to deal with that will only grow in the presence of um, fatty acids straight chain fatty acids. Um, uh, normally it lives in the axillary areas where there's sebum containing uh, straight chain fatty acids. If we have a patient who is fungemic with the organism that's coming up next, we're not going to know it unless we ask the laboratory to add olive oil to the culture medium as a source of fatty acids. Routine culture media is going to call those blood cultures false negative because the substrate wasn't there for the growth of malassezia, which is normal skin flora in the axillary areas. It's a lipophilic yeast. Um, statistically speaking, mostly what it does to humans is cause, this is the cause of tinea versicolor. Uh, which obviously is extremely common, um, but usually not a threat to a patient with a normal immune system. Um, the bigger concern is that recipients of lipid-containing TPN, and especially neonates, but this can also be seen in adults, are subject to central line-associated bloodstream infection with malassezia, which is a pretty bad syndrome. Um, the bottom line here makes the point about how we have to add olive oil to the medium or we're not going to recover the organism. And this slide is just uh, uh, to point out a more or less classic example of the appearance of tinea versicolor, which is very superficial, harmless um, skin infection, which can be treated with selenium. Um, skin scrapings, if we get lucky, should show us the classic morphological forms, which is spaghetti and meatballs. The higher magnification view shows the spaghetti and meatballs. And the treatment here is to remove the catheter, stop the lipids, and give either amphotericin or azole therapy. And for the final set of syndromes this afternoon, I want to talk about the brown pigmented fungi in general. We've already kind of touched on them a little bit at the very beginning um, and discussed a couple of syndromes that they can cause, but I want to round that out and make it just a little bit more complete before we finish up. Um, the technical name for these brown pigmented fungi is the demediaceous fungi. Um, their uh, spores are ubiquitous in nature again. Um, they produce brown pigments in tissue, and we'll see some more examples. Um, and this list shows you um, a number of organisms um, that fit in this category. We mentioned earlier uh, Phyllophora as one of them. These bugs can cause a broad spectrum of clinical syndromes, ranging from allergic fungal sinusitis, and they've really grown to prominence in this area in the last 10 or 20 years, where there's been increasing recognition that Aspergillus isn't the only mold out there that people get whoppingly allergic to, and these brown pigmented fungi also can cause chronic allergic fungal sinusitis, which is uh, very vexing, um, very chronic. Uh, many of the patients wind up having to have repeated sinus surgeries to remove big globs of hyphae and eosinophils from their sinuses. It, like Aspergillus fumigatus, um, also can cause allergic bronchopulmonary disease. Same syndrome, basically. Fleeting pulmonary infiltrates, 
um, bronchiectasis over a period of time, peripheral blood eosinophilia, eosinophilias and, and Charcot-laden crystals in the sputum. Um, and if you were in a place where you could check for specific anti, let's say, curvularia IgE in the serum, you would find it there. So allergic syndromes, but we already said the same bugs can cause chromoblastomycosis and mycetoma, which we already talked about. The exera hilum is now notorious after hundreds of cases of iatrogenic meningitis that were um, caused in patients who got uh, local steroid injections in and around the spine. Um, the issue here was mainly centered on um, in injectable steroids that were prepared in compounding pharmacies, um, some of which voluntarily closed, and um, it had to do with issues of um, cleanliness and functionality of the fans in laminar flow hoods and things of this nature. Big board question, huge. Um, <clears throat> And they can cause invasive disease. They can cause invasive sinusitis or disseminated infection. Um, and some of these are in immunologically intact individual, but many of them are in immunocompromised. When you have brown pigmented fungi invading tissue, um, that um, so you've got hyphal invasion in the tissue. That syndrome is called pheohyphomycosis. Um, this article that I've listed before is a recent, um, really well put together review of um, fungal infections associated with contaminated steroid injections. And here are a few patients um, who I've helped to take care of um, who have had some of these syndromes. So this guy um, had been an active duty Marine and spent most of his time in North Carolina and presented with chronic sinusitis and as you can see had to have repeated sinus surgeries to open up and to breed his frontal sinuses and ethmoids, as I recall. And over a period of time, his eyes uh, became abnormally separated and distanced from each other, um, which is called hypertelorism. And his sense of smell um, was not normal, and he had a chronic peripheral blood eosinophilia. Uh, at this time, his sinus CT scan looked like this. Um, so he's got diffuse soft tissue inspissation in his nasal cavity and his ethmoids. And the bony walls look pretty intact, but they're bulging laterally out towards the eyes. So the pressure from all of that inflammatory response in there even though the hyphae weren't invading tissue, they're pushing its eyes apart. This is allergic fungal sinusitis. His bug was Bipolaris hawaiiensis. Um, here it is growing on synthetic medium. You can see the brown pigment as the organism sporulates in culture. Um, this is uh, some of the material that was removed from his sinuses, a uh, silver stain, I believe. Um, and the point here is that these hyphae are kind of bizarre shaped. They're not a um, nice organized um, hyphae of aspergillus, which are narrow hyphae with um, acute angle branching. Um, these are wide, irregular hyphae with various swellings. Um, and here's the typical sporulation pattern of the organism in uh, culture. Once again, we have very distinctive um, macro canidia that have these little cell divisions within them. So these are septated macro canidia, which help to make the morphologic diagnosis. <clears throat> 
This was a um, young woman I cared for many years ago from Florida who uh, presented with an altered sense of smell um, and seeing double when she would defecate. Kind of an unusual presentation. And what was going on here? Okay, this lady, here's her uh, sinus CT scan. And I think you can appreciate that uh, both ethmoid sinuses have uh, soft tissue material where there should be air. And we can't really see the um, medial wall of the orbit, which is the lamina papyracea, which is the thinnest bone in the body. If we have a um, skull from a cadaver in um, anatomy class, we can actually take our finger and break that bone. It's like eggshell fragile. If you push on it kind of hard, it goes away. She doesn't even have them. So when she valsalvas, evidently the pressure is going up in here and she's seeing double because she's got disconjugate gaze at that point. Um, here's the biopsy material. Um, I think this is a PAS stain. Here the kind of irregularly shaped hyphae is um, highlighted in pink and you see a little bit of inflammatory response around it. And although we don't really demonstrate it in that frame, um, this bug was clearly tissue invasive. Um, the silver stain does an even better job of showing the varied morphologic forms seen in tissue in including these uh, big globose swellings within the hyphae. This bug was bipolaris. This guy we called, not to his face, we called him Starvin Marvin. He was very sick and uh, malnourished and wasn't eating very well. And young guy in his 30s. Um, no previous um, underlying conditions, previously healthy guy comes with left-sided proptosis and right shoulder weakness and some headaches, I think. He gets worked up and his CT scan shows left ethmoidal sinusitis and some bony destruction. And at the same time, his brain CT shows that he's bi got bilateral frontal cerebritis. Um, that guy we got to know extremely well. The, this man got loaded up over a period of a couple of years with somewhere between 10 and 12 grams of amphotericin and finally did okay. The, the treatment for invasive fungal sinusitis for life-threatening infection is debride it, just like you would um, mucor mycosis, rhinocerebral mucor, I mean, in a diabetic plus prolonged course of amphotericin, or for non-life-threatening infection, the azoles do have activity and they're often given on a case-by-case -case for many years to try and suppress this infection, which in previously normal hosts tends to relapse fairly commonly. And that slide always means that I'm done and you can ask me any questions if you want to. Thank you very much. Nobody wants to pimp me on any of these organisms? Okay. Thanks again. <laughs>